Good morning. Welcome to the SBC Daily Word for Tuesday, May 18th. After a week off, we're kind of going to begin a bit of a summer schedule. We're going to be doing the SBC Daily Word on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout May and June. Then we'll kind of reevaluate in July. But what I decided that we would do is spend some time walking through a book you've probably heard a lot of sermon series on and a lot of Bible studies centered around the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm using some sarcasm there because this is a book, even though it is very, very relevant for each and every time period, especially the time period in which we find ourselves, but it's a book that doesn't get a lot of study, especially in our tradition. So I kind of want to, in this first uh, summer SBC Daily Word, just get a bit of our bearings on this book that we know as Ecclesiastes. Elizabeth Actemeyer, in her uh, commentary on Ecclesiastes, describes Ecclesiastes within the context of wisdom literature this way. Wisdom is the result of practical experience and the careful observation of both the natural and human worlds. Out of all of the chaos of experience, wisdom finds customary orders in the world, ways in which human beings and natural phenomena ordinarily behave. Its, then, its aim then is to teach men and women these orders so they may know how to act in harmony with the world around them. So she's talking there about a genre, specifically in the Old Testament, sometimes in the New, called wisdom literature. And it's this idea that God has created the world in a certain way, and good and wise people will seek to find wisdom that helps them live with, quote, the grain of the universe. So most specifically, we think of wisdom literature probably in terms of the book of Proverbs. Not necessarily these legal promises, but these principles that for the most part when followed will lead to a certain measure of success. But what's helpful is within the Old Testament genre of wisdom literature, we have books like Job, we have books like Ecclesiastes. As Christians, we have the life of Jesus, who is the wisdom from God. Ultimately, for all the good things we say about Solomon, he is nothing compared to Jesus, who not only was wise, but is wisdom personified. Jesus lived a good and wise life, and he ended up dying a torturous death. So what Ecclesiastes does is it reminds us that life doesn't always go according to plan, that sometimes there are aberrations to what we regard as the normal order. And what Ecclesiastes does is it gives us an honest wrestling with how perplexing life can be. If you kind of look at especially the Hebrew poetry within Ecclesiastes, it's almost as if the author is kind of wanting to knock us off balance because that's what life does. And if anything could describe what the past 16 to 18 months have been like, it's been kind of this collective disequilibrium, this, this collective vertigo, this collective lack of balance. Just listen to some of these verses. And these are verses that we would never put on a magnet on our refrigerator. We would never needlepoint these and, and hang them on the wall. They're just verses where I don't know what to do with that. Ecclesiastes 1.18. For in much wisdom is much vexation. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Sometimes you wish you didn't know what you know. Chapter 2, verse 13. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is much more gain in light than in darkness. So which one is it? Does knowledge and wisdom lead to more pain, or does it lead to more light? They're kind of going back and forth, up and down, this, this lack of balance. 
What do you do with Ecclesiastes 5.10? He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. Okay, write that down, file that away. Money will not bring you satisfaction. Then Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19. Bread is made for laughter and widen gladdens life. Wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Which one is it? Ecclesiastes 7 3. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of faith, face, the heart is made glad. Okay, so so we should be um, focused, serious, not foolish. But then 8.15, and I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and be joyful, for this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. So Ecclesiastes is kind of this hodgepodge of this wisdom, this wisdom, and then getting them to fit together is really a fool's errand. In wisdom literature, we have how foolish sometimes life can feel. Within the history of God's people, the author of Ecclesiastes, in the words of the preacher or the teacher, in your English translations, the phrase will be, then the preacher said, or then the teacher said. That's the Hebrew word Kohelet, and it's just this idea of kind of this wise sage. And what I think this wise sage is doing in the words of Solomon is he is telling God's people as they're getting ready for life after exile, a life that will lead to some prosperity for them. He wants them to learn from the life of Solomon, that Solomon gave himself to wisdom, that Solomon gave himself to wealth. He tried everything this ordered world has to offer, and it ended in an historic failure. Ultimately, the kingdom that Solomon seeked to establish never really panned out. And if everybody, if anybody knows that, it's those who came out of exile back to the promised land. So just as I was thinking about what texts would be especially relevant for the time and place we find ourselves in, I think Ecclesiastes would be helpful. The other reason I chose Ecclesiastes is I'm reading a book by uh, Paul Zoll, who was a retired Episcopal priest, uh, this book is called Peace in the Last Third of Life, a handbook of hope for boomers. Now, hopefully I'm not living in my last third of life. Hopefully I have much more than that ahead of me. But a lot of people that I love and a lot of people that I pastor could be considered boomers, part of that great generation that was born after World War II, the baby boomer generation. And this book has been very helpful as I've read this to try and help and understand and shepherd uh, these boomers in my life that I love. And this book, as I was reading it, I'm like, this seems so familiar to me. I've, I've read this before. And all of a sudden I realized, it seems as though what, what Paul Zoll is doing in this book is at the end of his life, in fact, he just recently had a pretty significant health scare and they're hoping that his health recovers. But as he gets to the end of his life, this wise and godly pastor wants to help his brothers and sisters who, who find them, who find themselves in that same space um, to end their lives well, not to end their lives, but, but, but to, to come to their life's conclusion with peace, with hope, and with love. So we live in a world that seems to do um, this cancellation of boomers. Have you heard this phrase, okay, boomer? Um, there's this idea, people younger than boomers, millennials, et cetera, are kind of canceling out a lot of boomers in their lives. I think we need to push it back against that. I think this generation of baby boomers has a lot to teach us and a lot to teach the generations that are even younger than I am. However, I also want to be sure that if you're a boomer and you're listening to this teaching, um, 
that you would be a person who wouldn't be giving other people reason to cancel you. That boomers don't have to be jerks in the last third of our life. That when we get to the last third of our life, sometimes it's a cliche, but sometimes we become grumpy old men and women. And I don't know that we have to do that, but I do know that for us not to become those grumpy old men and women, we need to be a people who are self-aware. We need to be a people who understand what is going on within us. And, and this book by Paul Zoll is really helpful in this regard. He says this, the last third of life witnesses a felt decline in the quality and number of the things that mattered to you when you were in your second third. What things, however, about our life do not fade? The pain of early loss does not fade. The pain of early rejection does not fade. The pain of early disruption does not fade. That oftentimes as our lives in the last third begin a physical, um, professional, emotional decline, often what rises to the surface is pain, loss, disruption from very early on in our lives. Reverend Zoll did a lot of chaplaincy work. And one of his responsibilities was to visit people in the dementia hall of a local nursing home. He tells this story. My own experience in Alzheimer's units has borne this out over the years and with almost impeccable regularity. I was struck early in my ministry by a patient, an ancient bachelor who had never been married, who whenever I visited him in his nursing home would always go back to one event in his adolescence. He was far gone in his senile dementia, but of one event he never let go. Paul, for that was his name, told me about 150 times that he had lied to his draft board in 1917 when his number came up after the United States entered the First World War. He had thus avoided serving in the army, but he never forgot what he had done. Paul's conscience was bothering him right up to the year 1988 when I saw him for the last time. So on the one hand, Conversations with Paul were a vinyl record on repeat, but on the other, he was a clear witness to the power of an early bad experience to impress itself upon the soul. Paul says to the Corinthians that when our outer man it wastes away, the inner man is renewed. The reason that's the case is because oftentimes as we experience physical decline, what is going on inside of us tends to emerge with more vividness. What that story about this dementia patient reveals to us is that early pains and losses in our lives, they tend to stick. This is why Zoll says on the next page, the biggest block to peace and hope in the last third of life is the unresolved, unhealed experiences of suffering from a person's past, usually the distant past, which seems to hold on to you when all or most other attachments and buoys even are gone. The key, therefore, to peace and hope as the accompaniments, indeed the outcome of a person's physical life and journey is, okay? So the key for peace and hope in the last third of life is the resolution of unhealed, unresolved pain from the distant past. That is a maxim to underline and repeat. So in a similar way, in Ecclesiastes, the author is taking the words of Solomon that likely had been collected by the Jews during the exile and after the exile, and then he is, he is describing these words and recording these words 
so that people at the end of their lives can, or even the beginning and the middle of their lives can live according to the wisdom that was collected for us. So let's just look at the first two verses. The words of the teacher, that's Quahelet, might be preacher in your translation. The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So all of the women and the wealth and the weapons that Solomon had, had collected, they proved to, at the end of his life, really mean nothing. It all continues. He's really, really good at, at bringing things, illustrations, to just to bear on the truth that he's teaching us. In 1961, Rod Serling's television series, The Twilight Zone, broadcast an episode entitled Static. The episode was written by Charles Beaumont. In Static, we meet a long retired man living out his unhappy, lonely days in a boarding house inhabited by people like himself. Solo retired individuals who are mostly flaccid and bitter and who watch television most of the day in the sitting room of the house. All of a sudden, the hero begins to hear radio broadcasts from his youth on an old console radio he has found in the basement of the house, which now sits awkwardly in his untidy bedroom. He lights up. These are programs he recognizes from almost 40 years ago. The pleasure he gets from these programs, which it turns out only he can hear, is overwhelming. The old programs, which no one else in the rooming house proves able to hear, try as he does to get them to hear, force Ed, the hero, toward an involuntary crisis of tortured memory within himself. And what we find out is that he took the wrong road several decades ago and failed to marry the right girl who it turns out is still living, though in late middle age herself, right in the same rooming house. The script explains why. The power of this episode of The Twilight Zone is that Ed's blasts from the past reopen in him. The sluices of love and feeling from his youth, and he is able to reach out to his long lost and neglected love and to reunite with her. The climax of static has the man literally turning back into the man he was at 25, and she to the woman she was then too. As Rod Serling states in his concluding narration to Static, around and around she goes, and where she stops, nobody knows. All Ed Lindsay knows is that he desperately wanted a second chance, and he finally got it through a strange and wonderful time machine called a radio in the Twilight Zone. Now that's a wonderful story. In fact, I want to do everything I can to find that episode and watch it this evening if I can. But what Zal is saying in his book is that ultimately when we get into the last third of our life, there will be things that draw us back to early experiences in our lives. And what Zal wants, and I think what the author of Ecclesiastes wants, is for us to take those experiences to God so that the last third of our life cannot be given to an unhealthy, dark, reminiscing of how we wish things used to be. Because aside from the truth of the twilight zone, we don't get a second chance, which is why Ecclesiastes ends this way. Vanity of vanity, says the teacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the teacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs. The teacher sought to find pleasing words and he wrote words of truth plainly. The sayings of the wise are like goads and like nails, firmly fixed are the collected sayings that are given by one shepherd. Of anything beyond these, my child, beware. Of making many books, there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Beloved, 
I believe what Paul Zoll is saying in this book is true. That as we get into the last third of our life, hurts from the past will emerge. And what Ecclesiastes says is, as you face those things, fear God and obey his commands. And one of those commands is to forgive those hurts from the past. To forgive yourself for those hurts from the past. To forgive yourself for the decisions that you made or didn't make. And then to face this hopeful truth that one day God will right all those wrongs. God will heal every wound we have received or inflicted. And that sets us free to fear God and keep his commandments. Thanks for joining me. I'm looking forward to walking through Ecclesiastes with you. I'll check in again with you um, on Thursday of this week as we begin to walk through section by section this series called Wisdom for Life Under the Sun, Expositions of Ecclesiastes. Thank you so much for joining me. Grace and peace and everything good be yours.